shipped again. So a great wrap up to the year, a great message following Christmas. Uh, I, I was all in, so I, I loved it. Hey, first time, first time pulling pulling Micah off the media computer Ooh, yeah. and saying, hey, what did you hear? What were people talking about yesterday? What is after Christmas like for for you? I mean, I've given you a lot of different things I mean, to say. There. Yeah. <laughs> I, after Christmas is kind of that season uh, it, where the excitement is going, like you were saying yesterday. Like, there's no more presents. There's no more parties. There's no, nothing more to look to uh, other than leftover food that you really don't want to eat. Uh, it's that season of of when you have all these packages coming in and you're really excited about them all coming in and then all of a sudden you don't have any more coming in and you're like kind of like man I feel like I I, I feel like yeah I, I want I want to order some more because I want more packages. It's like in. the post Christmas <laughs> discouragement. Yeah. So what you're saying is all of those presents didn't really live up to the expectation, yeah. mm -hmm. and it left you with this. Lack void and lack of fulfillment. We thought it would be so fulfilling to have all this new stuff and all this fun stuff, and uh, and we either didn't get that one thing that we asked for, <laughs> or or we did, and it just it you know it's already yeah. well we're three days in, and I don't know maybe it's even still yeah. in the box, or maybe you <laughs> wore it once, or you shot it once, you know whatever it was, and it just didn't live up. So Egypt again, a opening. Wise men were gone. What what did you hear? You want to go? You want me to, Micah? Go ahead. Go. You're good. Yeah, so I, I love the fact Egypt is inevitable. This this message for, for me is it was is really meaningful because it puts things in perspective after Christmas. You know, and and, and ultimately learning that things are gonna happen, seasons are, are inevitable that we walk through, but how we respond in those moments is so key to really our, our journey. You know, I think Joseph, we really put the, the spotlight on Joseph uh, this past week because so many times Christmas uh, can become a lot about Mary. It obviously is all about Jesus, but I think the leadership of Joseph leading his family as a father how you respond in those moments, just reflecting in that moment for me, how we respond in this year, this past season, I think is so critical as we move forward to how we respond to other situations and, you know, being a Christian in this season of life and in this culture, in this day and age, how will you respond? Uh, sometimes we don't respond the best way, but I, it will determine and it will dictate your journey moving forward. Yeah, it reminds me of that song, uh, Sea of Victory, when it starts off, the weapon may be formed, but it won't prosper. Mm. Uh, it, it's just pointing out that I, I think a lot of times uh, new Christians kind of get mixed up with the fact that uh, if you come to Jesus, you'll have a good life. And uh, so, so it kind of tricks them into thinking that there's going to be no, no trials, no, no tribulation, nothing to come from it. But the uh, the reality of it is, is that Egypt is inevitable. Like something's going to come, and you you will be be tried, and and there will be temptations that you'll go through. But it, it's how you respond, as we talked about yesterday. It kind of reminds me. I'm sorry. Oh, go, go. It kind of reminds me. Uh, Pastor Chris mentioned a couple weeks ago how we're we're deeming this year the worst year ever. Like 2020 was the worst year ever, and Pastor Chris went back to the 1900s and pointed out. All the world wars and everything's going on and then like we can count on there being another year that we're going to deem the worst year ever it, it's just how we respond to this year is what what's really important so the to dig a little deeper into something that that wasn't just st standing out in the message or maybe we didn't have time for is the difference between living for jesus and not living for jesus is not how much better your life is going to be on earth mm -hmm. That's not the difference. It's how much more obedient your life is going to be on earth. Right. And the focus of understanding, look, bad things happen to bad people, and bad things happen to good people, and bad things happen to fallen people, and bad things happen to redeemed people. The question is, will you be with Jesus when they happen? Right. Or are they happening because you're not with him? Mm -hmm. They're going to happen. The only difference is, are you going to call some of them as well? Or are you just going to be going through them because you're with him? And exposing, I believe, that 
misunderstanding of, hey, give your life to Jesus and everything will work out. Yeah. Everything will fall into place. Mm -hmm. It's probably not true. It's, it's not yeah. likely that that's how that's going to happen. In fact, it's more likely that when you give your life to Jesus, when you are obedient to God's will, that the enemy is going to amp up the attack against you to try to convince you to go back to being worse than you were before you met him. Yeah. That's more often what we see, is that when people give their lives to Jesus, the attack, the challenges, um, the things that they have to be obedient in, the things that they have to begin to deny themselves of, the things that they have to begin to overcome and, and have a tempered... What I love about Joseph is you can read his temperance. Mm. You can read the solidarity of this man. Mm -hmm. He was just a tempered individual. I see him as just, he didn't know, he didn't have a lot to say, but when he said something, you leaned in and you wanted to hear it. He was very tempered. He was very stable. He didn't react, yeah. although everything around him, it certainly legitimized any type of reaction that there would have been. We would look and go, well, yeah, man, I mean, that's understandable. But he didn't respond the way that, I don't know, I think I would have. Egypt is inevitable. Emmanuel didn't come to keep us happy. Mm. That, that was good. That yeah. was solid. I, I Actually, when we heard that, that phrase, when you said that quote in first service, I immediately texted to Micah. Yeah. Because I was like, that's a quote that we want to put on I'm our social media. We're going to make a graphic out of that. <laughs> We're going to make a graphic. Because... Emmanuel, God with us, for those of you who, who may not know that, that that is its interpretation, God with us, Jesus didn't come to make us happy or to be kept happy. Yeah. The presents are not for happiness, right? It's, you know, oh, I want to give you a present to, to make you happy. Jesus didn't come to make us happy. He came to make us holy, mm. to, to, to have relationship with us, to commune with us, to have uh, this this lifestyle that we can turn to him because he's here with us. I, I just, I was blown away when you said that. I was like, Ooh. well, uh. and, and I'm not really that good. God gave me that yeah. in my notes Praise Sunday Jesus. morning as I was going back through, because we have this idea that, that God's presence is tied to our happiness. Mm. And we think that when we're unhappy, that God is mad at us right. or his presence is gone. But sometimes it's that thing that he uses to make us more like him, to make us more holy and to accomplish his will. I think it was like, uh, man, it had to have been over a year ago now, over a year, maybe two years ago. Uh, there's a quote that you said in a sermon uh, during our series. I think it was God didn't say that or God never said that. And it always stuck with me. It was happiness without holiness is helplessness. And I remember you said that, and that like those were one, that was one of the quotes that like stuck with me because <laughs> the fact of the matter is is that God never like He never said that hey you're going to be happy like that's what I'm calling you to but He said you need to be holy right. like I'm calling you to live a live a lifestyle that's holy and if that if you have to sacrifice your happiness in order to do that then so be it yeah. Well, and I think, and this really kind of goes to point number two, Egypt is not eternal. We can oftentimes get so caught up in the seasons or our happiness because this season of life, I'm not happy. Therefore, God is not in it. Well, no, no, no. We, we're, we, we can't just get so stuck in going through the motions or be stuck on the current situation or circumstance that we are in we have to understand that this is not eternal. This is not my ending place. This, right. is, this doesn't have to be my period. And you said that yesterday. This could be only a comma that we can continue to, to work through. And I love that even when Joseph was asked for the third time <laughs> by the angel, like you said, he, he was a very tempered man, like to, to not argue, to not have something to say back, um, to say, all right, let's go. You know, to pick up his family and to move and to have that sort of response through the season, through, I mean, what was going on around them with the, the innocent murder of all those babies and even, even pointing to, to Mary's response, like how, I mean, all these mamas are losing their babies. How, what, what did Mary think in, in all of that, that that was going on? So I just think that we have to look at our circumstance and our situation not as this end-all thing that 
our lives are over, but God is working this out with us. He's hand in hand. I, I think of the term happy as such like a worldly term, mm-hmm. term to, de- to describe an emotion that you're feeling in a moment. Like uh, uh, Egypt is not eternal. I think the question is better like are you ha- rather than are you happy, like are you joyful? Like, are you being joyful in the season of Egypt where you feel like nothing's going right? Are you choosing to have joy in your life? And that's something that is eternal because happiness is based on a circumstance. You've said that so many times. Happiness is based on a worldly thing that you find value in or you find your, your emotions in. And when, when you base your, your happiness on something like that, when you go through Egypt, you're, it's going to be tough. But when you have joy all the time and you choose to have joy in the fact that Christ died for you and you choose to have joy that in the fact that Christ is calling you to more, uh, it makes that Egypt season, uh, it puts it more to perspective of the non-eternal. Let's make it even, in, even more practical and personal. As I said yesterday, I, I believe I was raised not by my parents but by the culture mm-hmm. to be a, a saved by the bell. Um, California dreams, Disney generation. Like, that's what impacted my mentality. Like, that's what I thought happiness was. That was my idea of happiness. Your generation is social media, Mm -hmm. is Instagram, Snapchat. And now we've put a mask on this generation, which I'm I'm not against, like, protecting other people from getting sick. If you have something, or even if you may or think you have something, I'm not against the wearing the mask. That's not what this is about. But you take a generation that was already isolated, yeah. and you put a mask on their face. So now, not only are they downloading and inputting more than they ever have before, because it's incessant, Instagram, it is instantly downloaded, scrolled, one thing after another. Their relationship with Jesus is literally based on a minute and 20 second clip that they scroll past. That's spending time with Jesus for this generation. Mm. And helping this generation, even if they have the mask on, still be able to to breathe out. And not just download and have input, but at some point have an opportunity to have output. And not be so driven and so motivated by just social media, here's what. If my happiness was tied to a two and a half hour movie, your happiness is tied to a highlight reel. And that's the cliche, but the happiness of this generation is tied, and I'll say this generation, I'm talking 40, 50, 60 year olds that scroll on Facebook, or 14 and 15 year olds that scroll on Snapchat, or 18 to 25 year olds that scroll on Instagram, and I don't even know if those demographics are right. (laughs) I just, as a predominant social media aspect, Your happiness and our happiness, if you get stuck scrolling, is tied to somebody else's highlight reel. I have literally had to fight back for my fight for my joy back in a moment Mm -hmm. of scrolling. I would call it in Egypt. Mm -hmm. Because Egypt is the world at that time, and that is what is influencing this generation so much more than God's word. So asking these questions, man. Am I just working hard to accomplish what I see other people accomplishing? Or am I really following Jesus so that I can achieve His will for my life? Is that my objective? Yeah, I, I think personally, um, you know, we're, we're, having, we're having a generation that is raised having an identity crisis. Mm-hmm. Because they're finding their identity in so many different things. Uh, what do I identify as? You know, we're, we're getting into that day and age as... You know, what gender am I? What gender attraction do I have? All these different identity crises. And, and I mean, are we really identifying with, with who God's called us to be? Mm-hmm. You know, ultimately is, is really really what Joseph, Joseph could have easily said this same, this same thing. Like, man, I'm identifying as an Israelite or I, I'm a Jew, but yet I'm being pulled into Egypt and I'm being pulled in all these different directions. I have to now identify as an Egyptian, but this is not my culture that I'm in. Right. But so many times, no matter what direction we, we go, you know, we still have to stay firm in who God has called us to be. Egypt is not eternal, but something is. Mm. So they went back to the land of Israel. 
after the threat had dissipated. And, and I don't know if we're in a moment where a threat is dissipating. I, I think that we're possibly in the moment where the threat is increasing, whatever you want to call the threat. The threat to, I don't know, man, God's will, the threat to morals, the threat to mm-hmm. standards. And, and I'm not like, I'm not stocking up on bullets and getting ready to defend my rights. I, okay, I am stocking up on bullets, <laughs> but it's just because I like, I like them. Um, and I like to shoot my guns, not at people. Um, that's not why I'm stocking up. But I do believe that we should begin to store up. I believe that this is a time where the so-called children of God should begin to store up. And again, heavenly treasure. Mm-hmm. Like, I believe we're in a season of preparation of our faith to be challenged. That's what I believe is happening right now in America. And that is why we're seeing when people's faith is challenged, you, you begin to discover whether their faith was genuine. Mm-hmm. And, and when that challenge arises, we begin to discover who we really are. And that identity crisis it's going to increase if we don't continue to dig in. And whether we're in Egypt or Israel, um, whether we're in a worship center mm-hmm. or out on the streets, we are establishing who we are doesn't change depending upon where we are. That's right. That's good. Egypt had a purpose. I can start. If you guys Go ahead. Uh, I, so I know we're talking about Joseph of the gospel uh, but I want to talk about Joseph in in Genesis and how Egypt had a purpose for him in Mm -hmm. the sense that it was because of what was going on in his Egypt season Mm -hmm. that he was crowned head or second in command of Egypt like I think that is the coolest thing and he was set uh, in a position during a time where there was a famine coming and it was his his responsibility to choose how he was going to lead this nation uh, to make it through the famine and they stored up for seven years and then they had that for seven years of famine because of his his, uh, ability to interpret a dream because of his ability his availability of God for God to be able to use him so I think that was really cool how it it just matched up so well because uh, honestly when we started talking about this message I thought we were talking about Joseph of Genesis because it, <laughs> yeah. he was the head of Egypt and everything but uh, I just think it's so cool how how literally e- Joseph's Egypt had a purpose and it led him to what God was calling him to do mm-hmm. well and and that was just another stepping stone and you ended up reading it in verse 23 so the family went and lived there of Nazareth you know the angel told them so so Egypt was just another place to get them away from Herod and then from there he was going to be called a Nazarene so they ended up inevitably going to Nazareth I I wrote this down yesterday because you made mention of it and I, I don't even know if that was really the total focus but 2020 had a purpose as much as we hated it <laughs> as much as it was grimacing at times 2020 had a a purpose and you can either look back on 2020 and say this stunk I hated being uh, many of you lost your jobs Um, racism became even more prevalent and out in the open and exposed and all of these little things started to happen that started really building up that ultimately the pandemic is just you know really really hurt us and we can be stuck in those moments or we can learn from those moments and what I saw yesterday in your message was, was that Joseph and Mary grew as a family because they were willing to do the things that God told them and directed them to do. And as we went through 2020 and as we look to 2021, I, I don't ever want to get to a place where I just slough off something that I went through and not learn from it mm-hmm. and not be who God's called me to be because I went through what I experienced. I want to be able to learn from that and grow from that and continue down the road that he's calling me to go. So I, I just, I love how 2020, it had a purpose so, so that I can learn from things and I can grow. So when I obey mm-hmm. and it, it, the battle is the battle of obedience is being obedient when it doesn't make sense. Yeah. 
And then an even greater battle of being obedient is being obedient when you being obedient is actually more difficult or causes more consequence mm. than if you would have just been disobedient. <laughs> like, if I just wouldn't have done this, right. then this wouldn't have happened. Yeah. If I wouldn't have done what I heard that still small voice called the Holy Spirit in me tell me to do, then then I wouldn't be feeling this way, this way. I mean, if we take 2020, for example, like, if, if I would have just gone to North Louisiana and gotten a job and done what I wanted to do, then I wouldn't be here with the doors closed on a sanctuary hoping to God that Facebook flows this morning. Yeah. <laughs> hoping, hoping in Jesus' name yeah. that the church stream doesn't break again and right. we, can, we can get this message out this week and we can minister to... Uh, the people that call this place home and, and the ones that don't don't call it home yet or are about to call it home. So it's those it's those moments of obedience when it doesn't make sense. Yeah. And it's those moments of obedience. And I, listen, I believe that 2021 is about to bring even more of those moments. Mm -hmm. I, I believe it's going to, specifically for people who call themselves children of God or followers of Jesus, right. it's going to bring more opportunities to be obedient Number one, when it doesn't make sense. And then number two, to be obedient when what you are being obedient to or what you are staying tempered in or what you are maintaining self-control over or whatever is actually causing you a greater consequence than if you would have just been disobedient. But I believe that that's the place where our faith can be tested and yeah. tried and found genuine. Hey, Pastor Dylan, did we post a, a study for you? Got it? Yeah, uh, it's called Going Through Hard Times, and uh, the basis of it is is letting God use your whole life, uh, the good and the bad, for His purpose. Because one of the most important questions that you can ask while you're going through hard times is, God, what are you trying to teach me right now? I mean, that's what we've been talking about. Like, what, 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 like, what are you showing me through this season? Because we could have went through 2020 and just came out the exact same if we didn't evaluate what God was trying to use us uh, to do and what, what He was trying to show us through a season of our time. So that's the Bible plan. Uh, yeah. As we're, as we're bringing this year to a close and, and we're right at 23 minutes here. So we'll shut down in two or less. Um, I want to, one reminder is this Wednesday night, we'll have a worship and communion. We have, we have songs, a short message, a time of communion, more time for worship. And then at the end, we're going to fill out some prayer cards of, of what we're believing God for. Um, what are you praying about? Well, if you're not believing God for anything, you're probably not praying about anything. You're probably not asking for anything. It may just be because you haven't really sat down to even consider what he may be wanting you to believe him for. And so we got all those things coming up this Wednesday night. If you can't be here in person or, again, um, you are extremely concerned um, and and. You should be concerned about large group gatherings. If, if your doctor specifically recommends you don't be a part, that will be streaming live here on our Facebook. All you have to do is grab a piece of bread and some grape juice or some whatever juice. My wife and I, we forgot grape juice. Um, I haven't drank wine since I wasn't living for Jesus, just how I was raised. It was a great thing of how I was raised. I never got addicted to alcohol. The only time I ever drank was when I wasn't living for Jesus. So I didn't drink at my wedding day. I drank grape juice, except for we didn't have any. So somebody found, like, so I think it was like some sparkling water or maybe like some white juice of some sort in the back of the, the church that we got married in uh, with a wafer or a, a cracker. I think we had a cracker and some white juice for, <laughs> for communion at our wedding. And uh, we're going on 12 years, and Jesus has placed his hand <laughs> upon our lives. So use whatever you have. You can receive communion with us right there where yeah. you are. If you can't be here physically, we would love to see you log in. Comment, post. Hey, if you have any questions, concerns, please let us know. God bless you. Thank you for tuning in. I hope this was helpful.